Sevasminotati, Sevasminotati, Reverend Fathers, uh, dear professors, dear friends. My topic is about the resistance, uh, social uprising, revolution, questions to the canonical tradition. Let me start forth with to not, a lot to lose further time. In, 2000, uh, in 1201, according to Nikita Skoniatis, the people of Constantinople uh, was uh, very angry uh, because of the liberation of uh, a criminal treatment, Kalmovic. That was the 13th century. We could say that the orthodoxy was by then consolidated in the Byzantine Empire. It was not a time when still there have been quite a lot of heathens as uh, uh, of the time of the Antiochian uh, praising of the Andrians in uh, the 11th century or uh, at the Nika uh, uprising uh, later on. So the uproar in 1201 had, uh, as a result, the liberation of Kalamovius, uh threatening to throw the patriarch out the window, the prelate of the Eucharistic uh, congregation, unless he obligated the Emperor Alexius to liberate the tradesmen. That was an extreme incident uh, that goes beyond doubt, but it still pays testimony to a Byzantine reality, the possibility of uprising on political uh, reasons uh, in the ampler sense of the term and the extremity of the incident leads to the question as to how within history the Christian consciousness may be associated to realities and possibilities of the time. Quote, uh, as of each time, um, according to the anarchist Christian Jacques Ellille, uh, the Christians having uh, been adherents of a violent movement did so because they endorsed the, the prevalent uh, mentality of their society. But it is clear as to what violence is and what not. And uh, it is a long debate, just as it is what can be uh, tolerated and not tolerated as violence. Moreover, there are forms of uprising and disobedience which do not consequently result in the exercise of bodily or armed violence. So in order to deal with the topic in a very generic condemnation of violence is not enough. The question of uh, public action, uh, whatever, popular action, be it in terms of our praising revolt or other, is theologically actual because it is about the responsibility of the subject of law within history, responsibility that is the um, uh, spinal cord of our gospel. The first form of disobedience may be the martyrdom. Actions uh, in public space uh, which are intrinsically religious and political. But this doesn't mean that any reaction is, by definition, correct. Uh, public uh, popular action may be a blind uh, explosion or the product of fanatism and the hatred towards the liberty of others, or this may be a quest for freedom. What is uh, every time the case uh, has to be seen more cautiously. But what we're dealing with is the latter of these versions, popular action as a demand of freedom and as a reaction uh, to a resistance to political tyranny. So uh, what shall we find about uh, this revolt or uprising if we go to the texts? First of all, we'll come across the 84th Apostolic Canon. Uh, whoever uh, insults a king or a, a high rank officer will be punished. And if he is a clergyman, he will be uh, deposed. And if he is a layman, he uh, will be aphorized. So the, last, the first impression is obviously that the canon condemns any uh, resistance to the king or any uh, high rank officer. But if we are careful, we will find out this is not just an unconditional condemnation. As Theodorus Valsamon has uh, published, uh, a man of the regime and not some uh, uh, reversing uh, personality, if it is an insult uh, that we're talking about, this is one thing, control is another, and the canon doesn't say anything about it. This aphoretic uh, uh, formulation, he who unjustly and arbitrarily insults, demonstrates a very high sensibility of uh, the canon vis-à-vis -vis the uh, political control. So the justly, uh, he who uh, justly insults uh, the king or high-ranking officer is not to be punished. So Valsamon even shares with us the pre information that the Byzantines were more preoccupied by uh, the regicide issue, which uh, for some 
was that uh, only conspiracy set up for uh, bad regions would be punished and uh, conspiracies that are incited by good motives for defense of the city or for the murder of a traitor to the country, this is excused. Going back to the apostolic canon that uh, chastises the unjust insult to the uh, high-ranking officers, for the clerics, this is about... Uh, and as for the layman, it will be aphorism. The anathema, uh, which is uh, the banning from the orders of the church, uh, is a threat for other regions of disobedience. And the third order, or uh, uh, canon of Gangria, uh, is uh, that uh, servants uh, may not de- abandon their uh, uh, lords. And uh, that uh, the canon was about the status quo of the society, which is not uh, for now to discuss, but it expressly refers to the institution of servitude, not the political uprising the way we know today. Just as uh, some emperors in Byzantium uh, tried for this obedience of servants to their lord to extend to an obligation of uh, subservience of uh, the subject to the emperor, precisely because they wanted to uh, put to value this extreme uh, penalty, which is anathema. Uh, for many, many years, the church I- refused to endorse this uh, absolute uh, condemnation, which is anathema for political revolution. Nevertheless, as uh, it was uh, demonstrated uh, by way of his living example, uh, the very much alive today, still, Konstantin Spitsakis, uh, uh, this uh, crack in the unity of the church, uh, in uh, the uh, desire to abide by the emperor's uh, will, happened in, uh, in the year 2000, uh, 2026 by Studitis, when he accepted the demand by Constantine VIII and issued a synodic tome which indeed threatened with anathema those who would uh, instigate uh, to revolution against the emperor. What happened to this tome? One half, one and a half uh, century later, we see uh, through Valsamon uh, the canon of Angra accused all the, uh, condemned all those servants who uh, were revolting against the uh, law, their lord. Valsamon did so not because he was in favor of the liberation of the serfs, uh, rather because he thought of anathema as a too heavy a uh, penalty. St. John Chrysostom uh, was his main uh, argument that was a falsely attributed uh, document uh, to Chrysostom Thomas, uh, on the basis of which anathema was uh, shunned in uh, the case of faithful people. And there is also a shocking question to all those who are in favor of anathema. How dare you substitute yourself to Christ by addicting a uh, ruling before the Uh, last judgment, Valsamon reaches our uh, interesting conclusion. Precisely because anathema is not conformant to the ethos of our church, says he, the synodic tom by Constantine and Alexius uh, that brought anathema to uh, the uh, revolted remain inert. In two words, uh, the attempt uh, uh, to condemn such uprisings uh, was ill-fated in Byzantium. Two centuries later, Matthew Vlaster, the legist, also expressed his surprise at the strictness of Wagner, this anathema. He is even wondering openly and remarked his words by Matthew Vlaster is, and what this would uh, imply today if the same question was put uh, forward for canonic texts. What happened to the Holy Fathers when they accepted anathema instead of a temporary barring from communion? So he himself is quoting the Chrysostomic text against anathema and reiterates the fact that this is the reason why Constantine's and Alexis' tomb did not remain valid. Two more instances can I quote when there was an attempt to naturally condemn uprisings. One, 150 years after the first one and another 100 years later on for the second one. Interesting case but time doesn't allow me to discuss them in two words. In these uh, more than 1,000 years of life of Byzantium, only three were the attempts for this establishment of the anathema system against the uh, revolted people, and they at no avail. Very typical is the effort to utilize this at the time of uh, civil war. 
in 1342 there was in Thessaloniki the very particular and interesting appraising of the zealots. Ioannis Kantakuzinos, uh, supported by major uh, land tenants and the uh, leaders of the Isikastic movement, uh, tried to usurp the throne from uh, Ioannis Palologos. At the time, Arminopoulos was writing his uh, sixth Bible, Exavivlos, and in these uh, Exavivlos described these uh, uh, tomes as a way to uh, threaten Cantacosinos uh, with anathema. But when Cantacosinos uh, prevailed with the Isikats, Arminopoulos also added the uh, counter argument to the uh, three uh, tomes by the Isikas patriarch uh, Saint Philothos Kokinos, uh, who was also a supporter of Saint Gregory Palamas. Philothos, uh, just as Valsamon, invoked uh, Chrysostom's position against uh, anathema and confirmed that uh, all three tomes indeed remained inert as non conformant to the objectives of the church. It pays also to um, underscore this conjuncture, the possibility of political uprising that was salvaged within court marks uh, by an Isikest and uh, an opponent to the revolted uh, zealots. Uh, one of the many paradoxes in history uh, of this uh, uh, linear reading of uh, history uh, demonstrating there is a latent dynamic that sometimes explodes. Uh, all these canonic conflicts uh, have been uh, built on a wider canvas. That was Byzantine political system. This I quote because it has to do with our quest today uh, in the life of uh, uh, that book uh, there is a reference to the hazards as to the bad uh, habit of Byzantines to every time uh, de designate an emperor from a different family. Hazars uh, represented the classical view of the hereditary uh, rule and the continuum of uh, the dynasty. But in the Byzantine time, something different happened, reflected in the response given by Cyrilus to Hazars. The Lord also, instead of Saul, uh, who did not uh, do what the God pleased, uh, designated David. And uh, da David was pleasing to him, and that is why he designated uh, David and his kin. So uh, the pleasure of God was invoked as a ground for the designation, but this, it cuts both ways, because it may liberate from the dynasty of uh, the family, but may even lead to theocracy. This uh, tendency towards theocracy, uh, therefore, was in friction with the precious axiom of the political uh, science of the 6th century, the kingdom is bestowed by the Lord, nevertheless offered by the citizens, and most particularly through the uh, factors of the regime, which is the assembly, the syncletus, uh, the people, and the church. Uh, so any a capable uh, orthodox could be an emperor, but undoubtedly he had to pertain a uh, little of power or he should uh, grain a power. It would be ridiculous to construct uh, the picture of a democratic or equalitarian uh, Byzantine in, in current terms, but the Byzantine attempt to uh, combine the new system to Roman uh, traditions in the monarchy uh, could uh, be interesting for today's uh, questions. Although we may not talk about citizens in the modern sense of the term, the absence of dynastic ideal reinforced the emergence of the subject. The possibility of government reversal was a constitutional axis, one of the fundamental, if I may say so, of the uh, regime. The opposition never questioned the political system, and that may have been the major uh, debility of the Byzantine person. Although he or she questioned uh, the hegemon, the emperor was uh, God uh, chosen, but uh, it, it was not the coronation uh, so much as the outcome of events that so demonstrated. So if an uprising uh, was successful, that meant that the Lord no longer favored that emperor and uh, favored the uh, prison instead. Hence, the very appropriate determination that the empire was structured and vivified by an ongoing revolution, which in different rationale was also consolidated by Trotsky in the 20th century, that having been the reason why the anathema against the prizing never uh, took roots in the Byzantine empire. Uh, 
uh, through this controversy, the emperor was the incarnation of law, but still under judgment. Quite typically, in the works of the fathers, there is a whole panoply of resistances uh, to emperors in order to maintain the stability of society. Still, the explanation exists that it's an institution by the Lord, but not every emperor is designated by God. This, to my opinion, uh, is a very important issue. In Byzantine realities, we examined uh, moments ago, there are two axes that are determined. The first one, uh, the decisive role played by power, who will prevail? May I repeat that uh, it was considered that uh, there was a uh, favored by God, he who prevailed, even uh, this person originally seems to be an illegal, uh, revolted. And, and uh, truly, uh, this gives no information as to the content of a movement. Uh, there may bring about a tyranny or a dictatorship, a junta, but the power is a nightmarish a criterion. A second axis. Uh, the uh, safety clause is the participation and uh, the response of the people. If for the criteria there are justice and freedom, but this participation sometimes was substantial, other times was just a specter of its own self. This is more close to today's realities we're faced with. Obviously, we're not going to find in Byzantium an elaborate uh, theory on uh, the change of political system, but it is a fact that besides cases of uprising for religious reasons, many popular uprisings were moved by political, social or religious demands, more freedom, more just uh, taxation, etc. Indicatively, I quote the case of an emblematic tyrant of Byzantine history, Focas. Uh, a centurion, uh, he usurped the throne by way of uh, an uprising and then he terrorized and unjustly ruled the people uh, with disapproval openly in uh, the uh, hypodrome. Uh, Ekaterin Christofoulou demonstrated that, the, that uh, such was the pleasure of the people when he was deposed and dethroned and executed that there is this hymn to the Virgin and the words are very typical. Could we, I wonder, speak of a popular uprising not being explosions but conscious political actions of disobedience and resistance? We might just as well, but I do believe that even nowadays this is something very difficult to attain. Uh, all too often, people are uh, operated as an adherent of a leader and not as a subject of revolt. Nevertheless, I insist that many aspects of uh, ecclesiastical uh, tradition demand that the individual adopts a responsible attitude of uh, separation from tyranny. Uh, but all too often, the ecclesiastics cannot uh, tolerate the uh, burden of the, the evangel. In many aspects of our literature, Byzantine and, and more recent, uh, the, the respectful uh, leader is uh, the transgressor of faith. So uh, the blatant truth that uh, the respectful is most and above all the leader that depresses is somehow shunned. Uh, quite typical is how uh, St. Nicodemus from uh, Holy Mountain uh, rejects any notion of political resistance, but when he collects uh, quotations referring to the uh, unworthy leader still uh, is contradictory because of his notion of social justice. An excerpt from prophetic texts, your leaders are revolted and uh, cooperators of thieves. They are looking for reward. They never give orphans what they are owed and they never take care of the interests of the widow. The leaders of uh, the country are like the hooves that tear apart their prey, uh, indulging in bloodshed and harm people to get their assets. In closing, only one more phrase, trying to leave uh, more time for the debate to follow, hopefully. If this prophetic uh, voice is taken for uh, literally, then uh, there will be an invitation, an invitation to actions uh, through the words of Gregory Palamas. Break the lines of the uh, unjustly accused, lift the burdens of those unjustly bearing them, and crush any servitude. Thank you very much for your attention.